I bought this nice 8 channel relay module of eBay for around $10, but during the process of getting it to run, I realized that it had some serious flaws and I ended up re-engineering the whole thing. I recently bought this 8 channel USB relay adapter and it came with shockingly little documentation so in this video I'm going to try to reverse engineer how it works and see if we can figure this out. The only usable silk print that is on the board is at the bottom side where 5 volts, ground, TX and RX are documented. And as you can also see on the bottom side the soldering job is not really the best and it really needs some cleanup. When looking at the board we can see three different ICs. One is a PL2303. This is a USB to RS232 converter. A second chip is the ULN2803 which is also a pretty common chip. It's a driver. And the third IC on this board is a small 8-bit microcontroller. It's an STM brand STM8S003F3 microcontroller. So this will probably take the USB commands and then switch the relays on and off accordingly. Since the micro USB port alone will not be able to power all 8 relays at once, there's an additional power supply here. So the first thing that I will want to figure out is what the polarity of this power supply is. And you can actually see that the middle pin here goes into what looks like a diode uh, for polarity protection and it goes into the anode side of this diode. So I'm guessing the middle pin is plus and the outer side is ground. But I'll double check of course. So the middle pin is plus 5 volts and the outer side is ground as suspected. I'll now hook up a power supply to that. To power arbitrary devices I've scavenged this cross type power adapter and just soldered a lead to it which I can then hook up to my lab power supply. So when hooking it up I set up my lab power supply to 5 volts and 200 milliamps but as you can see nothing visible is happening so I'm guessing that the lab supply only supplies relay voltage and does not supply the microcontroller that is on board. I'll now plug it into USB. And as you probably heard, there was some switching on there. This suggests to me that the microcontroller has some predefined setting in the EEPROM, uh, which uh, relays to switch on at power up. So about the only information that we have about this module is that it operates at 9600 baud and that it takes a hex 50, hex 51 initialization sequence. And indeed when I send the hex 50 command, I get a response of one byte hex AC which indicates the correct module. After I send hex 51, it accepts every byte and interprets it somehow and does some relay switching. But it doesn't do the relay switching as I would think it would. The documentation suggests that every bit corresponds to one relay, but this is not what I'm seeing. Because measuring this each time with the multimeter is pretty annoying, I'll hook up eight LEDs to the relays so I can see which ones are switched on and which are switched off. I have connected those up to my power supply which is uh, set at 2 volts and current limiting at 10 milliamps so that when multiple LEDs are on they will actually get darker but that doesn't really matter for this case at the moment. When I first power up the device these two relays are active so these two LEDs are lit. 
But now watch what happens when I give a little bit of a mechanical shock onto the relays. So with a little bit of a shock I can actually make them turn on. What this suggests to me is that the relays are all powered up, but not powered up enough so that they could overcome the initial friction that they have. And when I give them a little bit of a shock, then they kind of need less force and once they are active, the magnet uh, within the relays can actually hold them in place. So I need to figure out what the reason for this is. If you're wondering, the external supply is not drawing any power, so that is kind of curious to me. Then I went to measure the voltage that is applied here, and I found something really strange and odd, but look for yourself. So the 5 volt input supply that I'm supplying there actually reads a negative 80 volts. So this is really odd. But on the adapter itself, I do measure 5 volts. So this indicates to me that these two actually don't make contact. And the 80 volts are just some weird interference of the switch mode power supplies and are actually very high impedance. So I'll just quickly solder leads on here so we can actually supply it and see if that fixes things. And as you can see the issue is gone and all relays switch together. And here you can see me supplying incremental data to the module. When connecting external power directly to these leads, all eight of the LEDs lit up, as you could see, instead of just those two. So that mystery is also solved. The um, whole circuit could just not supply enough current, and so just arbitrary two uh, relays went on and all the others remained off. However, this thing has a different problem, and I really dislike that all LEDs come on at once because I don't want actually any of those to come on when it's just first powered up. Another thing that annoys me is that I can't read back the state. And I also don't know if um, the microcontroller has already been initialized with this hex 51 sequence. So if it has already been initialized and I send hex 51 to it, then it will interpret this 51 command as a switch command and it will turn some, some of these LEDs on and others off. All in all, that's pretty annoying and I really don't know why they did it that way because this STM8 has 8 kilobytes of flash. It's more than capable to do everything that I just explained. But I guess they just didn't go through with the programming of that firmware. Unfortunately, I do not have any experience with the STM8. So I don't have a firmware programmer for it, I don't have a compiler, and I've never worked with it. But I really want to get this thing fixed. So what I've done is I've cut a small PCB that nicely fits in there. I'll remove this connector here and solder the LEDs di directly on. I'll remove the STM8 and I'll replace all the circuitry by uh, ATtiny 2313. I've already written the firmware of the AT Tiny. took me about an hour and I've not tested it so far but it looks pretty pretty promising. So I'll just try to replace the parts that I need to replace and then test the AT Tiny.
under the microscope I just soldered the supply voltage leads here and I'm going to check if uh, those turned out to be okay before I gunk it all up with hot glue. So the 3.3 volts arrive just perfectly on those leads. Now I'll put some hot glue on there as a strain relief. I just also quickly soldered the RX and TX pins on here, but I'm not going to check those because under the microscope they look good enough. After confirming that the ATtiny 2313 worked as expected, I had to iron out some smaller issues, mainly I set the fuses incorrectly. I soldered 8 leads to the ULN driver chip and I'm going to gunk those up with hot glue right now. Because I don't want to go through each of these pins to determine which one goes to which relay, I've just soldered a lead to the 3.3 volts and now I'm going to test out which one is which. So as you can see, they are all in the right order uh, from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So pin 1 of the ULN goes to relay 1 and pin 2 of the ULN goes to relay 2 and so on. So very straightforward. And now I'm going to solder those to the ATtiny 2313. Time to test out if everything is working correctly. As you can see, once I hooked it up, all the relays went on. And that is because I store the initial state which the relays need to have in the EEPROM of the ATtiny. But the EEPROM at this point in time isn't set yet, so it's all FF. So therefore they all go on. So pretty much looking good so far. So as you could see, I can actuate each single one and I've uh, turned them on in series. So I sent hex 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, I think this one was 10, 20, 40, 80. And they all worked fine. Now I've set the relay default to this pattern here, hex 5, 5. And I'm going to disconnect power and reconnect it back up to see if this actually worked. And as you can see, it loaded the default state from the EEPROM, which is beautiful. As you can see, I've turned around the chip and glued it to the relay so it can't move around anymore. And now I'm going to let the relays count through from 0 to hex FF. As you can see, everything is working as expected and now the firmware is much cooler than it was before. I'll now quickly walk you through the firmware. But once I plug it in, it's detected as a prolific PL2303. And it registers as a serial port TTY USB 0. So I can now PicoCom to that. And as you see, you don't see anything yet, but I can hit a question mark here. And you'll see a help page, which shows you the commands. So Q is to query the relay status and relay inversion mask. So what the relays are currently set to. S sets the relays. It uh, accepts a hex parameter. T toggles a hex parameter. 
D sets the initial relay status and that is also persisted in EEPROM. With I you can set the inversion mask that is used and that is also persisted in EEPROM. And if you supply a second parameter to the S or T commands, those are executed for a specific amount of time before they toggle back to its original state. So this allows you to offload the timing to the microcontroller which has very precise control. This works up to 2.55 seconds. So I'll activate the local echo by control A, control C. So you can see what I'm typing. And let's first query the status of the relays. As you can see, they're all deactivated. What local inversion mask means is that all commands are also exclusive ORed with a certain uh, pattern. This allows you to have active low outputs without having to deal with those in the set parameter. So currently the output is set to zero and the inversion mask is also set to zero. Let's turn on number one. As you can see, the number one LED lit up and if I query the parameter again, I can also see that this is on and let's set this to two. As you can see, number two is on, four and eight. And of course, we can also do bit combinations. Set OF should turn on all the lower four LEDs. So what happened here is I was too slow typing and it times out after two seconds or something. So a character needs to be input at least every two seconds. This is because if the RS-232 receiver picks up some random noise and uh, this noise uh, is interpreted as a character and it ends up in the input buffer and then later on I want to send a command, this command would be corrupted. So the if no data is received or if no command is completed within two seconds then it just resets the input buffer. So I can also show you the toggling. So I'll now toggle 40 hex and as you can see one relay just went up and I can toggle it again and it went out again. I can also do this uh, with a timing so I can set uh, this relay toggle for one second. One second is 1000 milliseconds. The granularity is 10 milliseconds of this timing unit. So the parameter that I need to supply is hex 64. So I toggle relay 40 for 64. And you can see that it uh, toggles. And then after one second, it goes back to its original state. With this inversion mask, I can control which relays are active low. So let's set the inversion mask to relay one and let's set the output to all zero. You'll see that only relay one is actually active. And when I query that now, you see the status is actually zero, but uh, relay one is the inverted one. And this inversion mask is also persisted so that when I disconnect power and reconnect it, it uh, just memorizes which one, uh, which relay was active low. And of course I can also set the default, so the default to hex 55. Now I query the parameter, nothing changed, but it persisted hex 55 and the EEPROM. If I disconnect power now and reconnect it, it will come up with hex 55. But the inversion mask will still be one. Let's check this out. So as you can see, it just came up with hex 55 as a set and the inversion mask is one, which is why relay one is not active actually. If I set the inversion mask to zero, you'll see that we see the pattern hex 55 on the LEDs. I hope you enjoyed my little hack. As always, I'll uh, release the source code and everything as open source so you can download it and have a look at it and maybe modify it. And maybe someone can even port that to the STM8 I just don't have a clue about how the STM8 needs to be programmed, so that will be the ideal solution. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you tune in next time. Bye.